Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters Marketing Podcast, your source for all things marketing. My name is Adam Torres. You can follow me on Instagram at Ask Adam Torres to keep up with my book releases, book tour schedule, signings, all that other good stuff. Always love to connect with you there. And as always, if you'd like to apply to become a co-author of one of my upcoming books, just head on over to the website, missionmatters.com, and click on Become an Author to Apply. All right, so today I have Scott Handy online, and he's the executive director over at Handmark Creative. Uh, Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here, Adam. All right, so I'm excited to get into today's topic. I mean, marketing for startups, what startups can do, opportunity areas. I mean, this is going to be a good show. Um, but before we get into that, I wanted to start off by you giving us a little bit more of the background and why you started uh, Handmark Creative and, and what you're focusing on. Sure. Well, our focus is on content and helping startups who are a little bit mature, maybe three to five years um, history behind them. They've got, they're beyond their seed funding maybe and, and have a render two under their belt. And they're looking really at growth and how they can scale their content to help support and fuel and enable that growth. So we've started to really focus on that niche and we, um, we go across industries, across verticals, um, because I think what we have to share is relevant, whether you're a technology company or whether you're a retail company or a, you know, a bakery or whatever it is, that content can help any startup in any vertical to drive their business growth, especially at that stage of their life cycle. That's awesome, and I think it's a great transition too. Let's go. Let's go further into some of those opportunity areas um, that you see. So, I mean, we're looking at second. They obviously have a, par- a product. They obviously have some sales. They're uh, you know they're growing, and now they have to start thinking a little bit more heavily on on content and what that means. What do you think are some of the ca- uh, some of the challenges at this like pivotal point of growth for these companies? Sure. I think um, a big one is developing a strategy. Is what what are you trying to do? with your content and what realistically do you want your content to to do for you and your business. Um, and at this stage, a lot of companies have either outsourced their content entirely or they might have a, a relatively junior person internally who either handles it full-time and that's their full-time role or maybe it falls on them and they have other roles within marketing to do as well. And so content is just one of many hats that they have to wear. And the problem is that a lot of the content then gets created in a sort of slapdash manner and there's something that comes up last minute and they need a piece of content for it and it gets put together really quickly and without a lot of thought of how it's going to be used in the long term and it's just put together very quickly for this one short term use. And so over time then you have a lot of content that's disparate and it doesn't um, work well together. It may even be contradicting itself in certain areas. You've published a blog post six months ago that says something entirely different than a blog post that you published this week. And so over time, those things can expose you and it can expose weaknesses within not just your content, but your marketing and your business strategy as well. So taking a really good look at the strategy um, of wh- why you're doing content, what you want your content to do, and then how you can measure it, whether it's successful or not. Let's talk about what makes content good. I mean, because I think sometimes what you said is great. It's like sometimes somebody will they'll, they'll just see, okay, X, Y, Z holidays coming up or this theme happened or this happened in the news. And I see a lot of other people are doing this, so maybe we should do that. And you're right, that thought on, on whether or not that fits your brand or what you should be doing kind of is not necessarily taken into account. If it's just like this is what we should be doing because everybody else is. What do you think makes mm-hmm. content good for these companies? It has to resonate with your – target audience, your prospects, and your customers. Um, And so ultimately, it's the quality of the information or the messaging that you're providing. And I think um, ultimately for the person who's receiving your content, whatever format it's in is a secondary consideration. So whether it's a blog post or a video on YouTube or it's an article or it's a press release, um, ultimately, I don't think they care that much. What they care about is is the information that you're providing helping them in some way that's relevant to your business service or your business product that you're ultimately selling. 
Let's talk about um, that idea of quantity, because I like that you brought up quality, and we kind of went through that. Let's talk about quantity. What does mm-hmm. it take to stay relevant in front of your target audience? Yeah, I think that really depends on a lot of factors. One is your space that you're in. Um, are you B2B? Are you B2C? Um, how much engagement you're looking for and your resources? How much are you able to, to, per, you know, create on an ongoing basis? Um, you know, from a resource perspective. Um, so it varies widely. I mean, you, there are some companies that, produce a whole lot of content, you know, multiple social posts a day, multiple blog posts a day. And usually these are much bigger enterprise companies that maybe have a lot of different solution lines and dozens of products. So they're trying to provide coverage for everything that they sell. So they need to put out a lot of content at high volume. But if you're a small company that has basically one product or, you know, less than five products, say, but they're all related and they're all in the same vertical and industry, then it probably doesn't do you much good. There's a point of diminishing returns if you start just trying to crank out content at such a high volume. Um, there you should really focus on quality pieces that you can put out at a reasonable cadence, maybe twice a week, um, instead of looking to put out something, say, every day. And those pillar pieces of content that are longer form that you can break down into snackable bits that can provide content for your blog and social content and other things go a long way in making that sustainable for you. That's awesome. And, and I, could, I couldn't agree more. I always tell people, I'm like, you know, you got it, but you have to do something. So meaning you said like one to two a week, I mean, depending on industry and other things and resources, of course, because you have to, you have to make sure you're, you're, you're operating. But, and if, but um, realistically to stay in the game, to stay relevant in your niche or your industry, I mean, you have to put something out. I still see a lot of people mm-hmm. that I'm like, I did, and I, it kills me like year after year. I'm like, you're still not doing, you're still not doing anything. Do you know your competitors are? Do you know how hard it's going to be to catch up in five years if you haven't done anything? Like it's yeah. it's not it's not going to happen. You're not going to catch up. On, and even if you could, even if you do have the budget, you can't just like spray five years of content in a in a in a month or even in a year and expect people to follow it, consume it, and for it to grow. Like you said about that point of diminishing diminishing returns. So that I won't say slow and steady, but I like your word better. Good cadence and steady like wins the race long term. Yes, absolutely. So, Scott, um, in terms of um, platforms, so we covered, you know, quality, quantity. What about platforms? Like, what's interesting to you? Um, I think a few things. One is, again, if you're B2C, I think the the Facebooks and the Instagrams are great platforms. Um, B2B, LinkedIn, I, I think it's hard to beat that. They're sort of the behemoth at this point. Um, but you can still do some fun things on Instagram and Facebook as well, um, if you're looking especially to do some brand building. Um, But I think LinkedIn provides a great platform. Something like Medium, if you're looking to do a lot of blogging, I think is a great platform as well. Again, I think um, starting with a strategy and starting with the messaging and the information that you want to put out there and then find the platform that fits those is your best bet um, as opposed to starting with what platform I want to be on and then try to reverse engineer a strategy or a message that fits that. Anything interesting um, in your space that you're noticing um, in 2020 so far? Mm -hmm. I would say that one of the biggest um, trends, and it's been going on for a year or two now, I don't think it's it's new to 2020, Mm -hmm. is this idea of storytelling within the business framework. Um, Mm -hmm. I think it's more important now than ever before that as you're looking at content and strategizing content, it's not enough just to put together um, the more analytical pieces of content that look at data and features and fits and things that are going to appeal to the analytical or logical side of your customer's brains. You really have to, whether you're B2C or B2B, you have to be appealing to their emotive sides and storytelling is a great way to do that. Um, you know, there's a lot of research that supports the idea that B2B purchase decisions are even more emotionally fraught than B2C purchase decisions. So even if you're a technology company, say, that you're, you know, build a product, a piece of software 
that um, you know that the purchaser is is a developer or somebody highly technical. You still have to have an emotional component to your content in order to win that sale because B2B content or B2B purchase decisions, sorry, are much more emotionally fraught than even our B2C purchase decisions. Man, I love that. I knew, I knew you had something up your sleeve for me there. Uh, great stuff. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, Scott, if somebody is listening to this and they want to follow up and, and learn more, um, what's the best way for them to reach out? Um, I think email um, Scott at handmarkcreative.com. And Handmark is H-A-N-D-M-A-R-K, creative.com. Fantastic. Well, hey, Scott, it's been awesome having you back on the show. Um, and a pleasure, as always, catching up with you and uh, learning more. And congratulations on, on, the, on the company and all the great work you're doing there. So con- congrats on all that. And uh, to the audience, as always, thank you for tuning in. Hope you got a lot of value out of this. If you did, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Uh, leave me a review on the Apple iTunes Store. If you're watching this on our YouTube channel, Mission Matters Marketing, uh, definitely give us a subscribe there and uh, leave us some comments in the comment section uh, on the on the video. Love to continue the conversation over at the YouTube com- community and let us know uh, what's interesting to you in marketing in 2020 so far. And Scott, thanks again for coming back on the show.